Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, I'm Astrid, and I'm definitely an alcoholic. Hi, everybody. It's good to be here tonight, and it's an honor and a privilege, and I get to follow Charlie. Like, wow, I hope that's a big, big, big act. What, what was going on was so moving. It was so moving. I really, I feel choked up, and I'm hoping I'm not going to cry my eyes out like a little girl in a tiny pink dress. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What does it mean to be an alcoholic? It's the one disease that we have to diagnose for ourselves. And everybody around us can say, oh, my God, what a drunk. You're a loser. You're crazy. You're such a lush, you know, nothing but trouble. And it it isn't until we concede to our innermost self that there's something really, 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 truly, fundamentally wrong with us. And that took me a long time, and some people never get there. They never, ever, ever can admit and then accept what their devastating weakness is. You know, and maybe not everybody comes from childhood trauma, but I do believe that a lot of our insanity starts at a very early age, and it's sort of a setup for crazy later on when there's neglect or there's... um, too much discipline or constant fighting, screaming. And so at a young age, I learn how to get along with people through screaming and yelling. I get a, I learn how to get along with, with people through having to be right and getting the last word in and beating up my sisters and pulling their hair. And what's going to happen later on in life is I'm going to seek some type of pain relief for all of this madness that's going on inside of me because there's a restlessness and an irritability and a discontentedness. And I'm talking about my story. You know, maybe some people had a perfect, perfect, perfect childhood You know, their parents said prayers with them every night, and every birthday and Christmas was amazing, and Santa came down the chimney, and the Easter bunny was real. The tooth fairy flew through the window, and everything was just amazing. It wasn't that way for me. My mother's a German war survivor. She's 88 years old, and she's still really difficult. You know, and that alone, growing up in a war... I think you just have to become narcissistic. You just have to blame it on everyone else. You just can't get vulnerable and own anything. You're not going to make it, you know. And so I look at her, and for the longest time, I just felt so much pain around her. Like, I hated, hated, hated her. And... I didn't know how to get rid of that. And so many of us in here, we will inventory something over and over and over. And every time we inventory it, there it is again. There it is again. Why isn't it going away? And it doesn't necessarily go away because the issues and the tissues and the subconscious mind is in the whole earth suit. It's not just in here. It's everywhere. So I walk around thinking that... I'm going to come into AA and I'm going to be rendered white as snow. But what happens is that it's an ongoing process over and over and over again. And I started drinking at a really early age, you know, probably like 12 years old. And by the time I was 15, I was definitely drinking every single day. And, you know, when that happens to a young child, you already or I already have a lot of emotional problems. I have a lot of issues with getting along with people. I have a lot of issues with honesty. I have a lot of issues with self-esteem. I hate myself. I feel ugly. I feel dirty. I feel unloved. I feel unpopular. And so that vibration alone is going to be a setup for pitiful and incomprehensible deep behavior and pour a bunch of liquor on it and I'm telling you our clothes are going to go flying off we're going to say the craziest things we're going to go driving down the street and climbing up on the roof and having sex with God knows who and stealing God knows what and waking up on God knows what couch and and and, and the terrible cycle just goes 
on and on and on and on. And I believe, for me anyway, that a big part of why it goes on and on is maybe because the true message of Alcoholics Anonymous doesn't always get delivered. And maybe, just maybe, there's too many funny stories and there's too many drunkologues and there's too many canned pitches about what it was like, 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 like, and their life might even secretly look like what it was like. But they pretend, (laughs) but they pretend it looks like Yay, everybody clapped for me. And so I certainly don't want to stand up here and try to, oh my God, try to fool anybody or have you think anything else of me but a, a garden variety alcoholic. And I have what everybody else has here, which the big book so eloquently says, The main part of the illness actually centers in the alcoholic's mind rather than her body. And that I'm going to be the same woman drunk as I am sober unless I have a psychic change. That's interesting. What does that mean? So I, you know, my life was such a mess for so long. I junior high and high school and fake IDs and just honky-tonk bars and lower companions and, you know, people with guns and motorcycles and tattoos and craziness. And, you know, it's like my picker is broken is like the understatement of the century, you know. It's like... If you knock the shit out of your last three wives and you have a bunch of restraining orders and eight kids, I'm in love. It's something like, it's something like that, you know. I look at some Wall Street guy in a three-piece suit, you know, something like that. Hedge fund. Can you imagine a hedge fund husband? I wouldn't know what to do with a hedge fund. Still today, I just, I wouldn't even know how to go to Belize. I don't know how to do that, you know. I'm a jeans and t-shirt, you know, barely any makeup kind of a person. So I trudge along with, you know, with what I have, and it's one bad relationship after another. And what that does is it tears the self-esteem down even more and more and more and deeper and deeper and deeper until, you know, we get pushed into Alcoholics Anonymous. And, you know, it's through humility, you know, they call it a force feeding on humble pie. Man, I was so stuffed. I had indigestion with that crap. And, uh, you know, I the first time I went in, I did a 30-day detox. I spun dry. I did everything they asked me to. I, you know, went to all these meetings. And it was in the days where you could smoke in a meeting. I'd clean ashtrays and get a sponsor. Stick with the winners. I don't know what a winner is. I think a winner is a sponsor with big fake tits and a, and a Mercedes, and she can afford, like, nails. I can't afford nails. I don't have those things. Maybe that's what a winner looks like. I don't really know, but I know I look like a loser. So I pick, and that, that no offense to anybody that has big fake tits. It's just, no, it's just not a winner for me. There has to be more than your tits to be a winner to me. Like, there has to be something on the inside but I don't really know what I'm looking at at all. I, I really, I just, my eyes and my, my, my whole entire vision of the world is so skewed that I really am completely lost. So things don't go very well, you know. I try to do the steps the best I can. You know, step four and five are a really tough one. And, you know, some people get in an argument over this one somewhere in step three. It says, then it is explained that the other steps can be practiced only when step three has been given a determined and persistent trial. And, you know, this isn't a race. And so I know some people get very argumentative, like, you're taking that out of context, you know, and and Bob was dead, and Bill shouldn't have written that, and he wrote it after he took LSD, and whatever, you guys, whatever. Okay, great. Maybe he took it on LSD, wrote it on LSD. I don't know. Sounds good to me, though. It sounds really good to me. The other steps can be taken only when step three has been given a determined and persistent trial. What does that mean for me? It means I have to have a God in my life as a way of life. Like, I have to have some kind of spiritual relationship with a power greater than self. And like Charlie so eloquently talked about, 
how powerful self is. I, I love when he said, you know, an alcoholic, you can get him to quit drinking way faster than you can get him to quit playing God. Isn't that? It, the, the, the ego is so large and so in charge. And a part of why the ego is is so large and in charge, I look at, you know, the bottom of step 8 in the 12 and 12. It says, very deep, sometimes quite forgotten, damaging emotional conflicts persist below the level of consciousness. At the time of these occurrences, they may actually have given our emotions violent twists which have since discolored our personalities and altered our lives for the worse. And so in there... There's talk about childhood trauma. There's talk about things that happened that were so severe that no offense to Alcoholics Anonymous, but one inventory isn't going to dig all that stuff out at the root. It just isn't. And we see that more and more and more. And we see, oh, my God, I don't even have to tell you, the amount of mental illness is just pouring into our program these days. is like, holy shit. You know, we thought like a wet one in the back room was bad. Heesh. Those days are gone. I am I mean, just yesterday, for real, I'm driving down the street in L.A., and this naked, completely naked lady, and she's just screaming and yelling and dancing, and she's having so much fun in the middle of the street, and I'm thinking, I don't think I've ever seen that ever in L.A. I really don't think I've ever seen a completely naked vagina, breast, the whole nine yards, singing and dancing in the middle of the street, like, whoa, shit's getting weird out there. Really, really weird. <laughs> And it's getting weird out there, and I say that because I want to be one of the people that's there to keep the doors open for those people to come in here. You know, when it says step one, I'm powerless over alcohol, dash that my life is unmanageable, the landscape of Alcoholics Anonymous has changed so much that we have to at least try to grow with it. I am a true alcoholic, and vodka is the gateway to everything. Heroin, cocaine, stealing, sex, rip my clothes off, get in a fight with you, punch you out, steal your car, whatever. Just give me some vodka and watch her go. But, you know, the other thing is, is that these younger kids, they're in as much pain as we were when we were kids, and they're like snorting psych meds and cough medicine and I don't even know what strangest substances like can't you just get yourself some mad dog like what's so wrong with you you know what's with all the pills and the powders and the snorting and the, you know, just get a buzz a cheap buzz a nice cheap what are you doing you know but it's crazy and it's very crazy and there's a whole lot of psychosis out there and there's a lot of fractured children out there I have no idea how God's ever going to fix all these kids I, I just I don't know and even when we talk about the hell that we all came from where my dad beat me and my mom every day of the week you know I get it yeah these kids don't even have a mom or a dad half of them are in foster care the amount of children that grow up with both parents on drugs methamphetamine the lights are turned out there isn't even food stamps there isn't even hot water it's like oh my god anyway I know this is AA and I'm not going to go way off the track I'm just saying that the deep, deep down inside of all of us is so much pain and so much hurt that if we could feel it all right now we would blow the whole roof of this place off and it doesn't just disappear with four five and eight and nine I wish it did so the first time I got sober, I stayed sober for 10 years. I had a child. I was putting myself through college. And then, you know, just all of that insanity and that stress came back. And I just would wake up in the morning, just, you know, just fear on me. Like, my disease is up, you know, 30 seconds before me. And like, we're not going to make it, you know. Your life's hell. You're fucking crazy. You're so stupid to have ever done this. How did you, why did you think you could have a kid? You can't be a mom. You know, just so much pain and suffering. I would never speak to anyone like that. And yet I listen to this. Some people call it the committee or untreated alcoholism or stinking thinking. I actually believe that untreated par alcoholism is a partial parasite or a partial possession and that actually there's something that takes over and speaks to me with great authority because I can see it, you see. I can actually sit and I can observe it 
trying to clobber me, trying to mug me, trying to take me out, trying to lynch mob me. And I'm like, wow, you're doing that again, the bathroom scale one more time. How many times a day do we have to do that? And then look at our bank account. And then what? Look at my phone. They didn't call. Oh, let's go into some social media and compare our asses and our cars. And it goes on and on and on and on and on and on and on. It's no good. You know... The average alcoholic is not psychopathic. We're not completely disconnected from our feelings. We're actually really sensitive. We cry really easily. We get our feelings hurt really easily. We are emotionally very, very immature. We're fragile people. And I do believe that's why we have so much anger. And what's interesting about our type of anger, for most of us anyway, is that a good psychiatrist will tell you today that The child that stuffs their feelings and really can't remember what happened in their childhood is the hardest one to treat. But the kid that comes in and still says, you know how it went down? Let me tell you. And then they did this, and then they weren't even there, and I felt so alone, and I was scared out of my mind. Now we got something to work with. Yay. So honestly, to have the anger that we still have is the fuel for some type of transformation inside of us. It's not not always a negative thing. Anger isn't always a negative thing. I mean, okay, anger is kind of a negative thing if you like get a gun and go into Walmart, but if you can just feel your anger and your frustration from a childhood or from relationships or the hurts and harms where you tried so hard to get along with people, this is good because it keeps us in touch with our humanness. Anyway, at one point, I go out, and I go out in a big way. You know, Bill Wilson does this great one in the big book about, like, oh, the guy goes out, and, like, out comes his carpet slippers and, like, some frickin' robe. But the woman, sea hag, gone. Two weeks, gone, unrecognizable, just wiped out, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and uh, so watch out, ladies. It gets really dangerous. It's really dangerous out there going out. But I did. I went out, and I went out very hard. And by this time, I had an 11-year-old girl who did not see me until she was 14 and a half. You know, any parent in this room that did that, they know the same thing that I know. That pain never, ever goes away. I don't care how much inventory. You can inventory it day and night. It's never, ever going to go away. It's there because I'm human, and it's there because I have the instincts that Bill Wilson talks about in the 12 and 12 in the big book, and my instinct for security and my instincts for survival and my instinct for for approval and all of those are god given and they're human and we have a herd instinct to please each other and to nurture each other and alcoholism is so much stronger than my own instinct that I'll give my child away to somebody else and I'll walk out into the street and lose my mind which is exactly what I did so I was out in the street for years years a little over three years. I mean, it's just, I still try to wrap my mind around like three Christmases and three birthdays and three, it just, I, I can't even quite, because everything's a complete blur when you're in oblivion 24 7. The streets are a whole different ball of wax. It's, it's not a bar room. It's not even hanging out with the Hell's Angels. It's just kill or be killed. It's just this very primal, place where you're just looking people in the eye all the time and you're just reading what do you what do you got huh? what's, what's wrong with you and my body language changes you get all like this on the muscle I'm gonna kick your ass I don't know what's going on and what that is is just this terrified child inside but I don't know that people say watch out for her she's freaking crazy don't go near her that's right that's what I want you to say you know that's what I want you to think that's the kind of facade and that facade blocks me from ever feeling 
all the damage and all the pain and all the hurt and all the just torn apart human being percolating way down in the basement waiting for an inventory, waiting for a sober moment. So over the next couple of years, I have I have 23 prostitution cases and I have 18 drug and alcohol related cases in Los Angeles. I you know it's open container, drunk in public, you know, loitering with the intent to prostitute, prostitution. How about this one? Soliciting an officer. That always, that's always fun. Like, <laughs> come on, man, let's go. And then he pulls out his handcuffs, you know, and, and just in and out of jail and in and out of jail and in and out of jail over and over and over. And every time I would go to court, the judge would say, how don't you want drug diversion, Prop 36, and I'd say, death before detox, I'm not going. <laughs> thinking I'm all that and a bag of chips, thinking I know what's really going on. I'm not going there. I tried that AA stuff. I tried all that stuff. I'd rather die out here in the street. Anyway, you know, things went from bad to worse. I always tell this one story because it's so poignant, especially to a female and to a male, but especially as a mother. I remember it was pouring rain. It was February, and sometimes everything just floods in California. And there was this one house that was half burnt, and the other half wasn't burnt. So the roof was safe enough that you could stay in there. But if you've ever, ever squatted in a burnt house, the smell is nauseating. You want to throw up. It's really, it's a really painful situation. And there was this gal in there. And this black chick, and she was laying on a sleeping bag, and she was just pregnant out to here. And I'm just like, wow. I mean, I remember just tripping, like, tripping, like, what the heck tripping. And she had this look on her face, like, don't you even ask me anything. It was just that feeling of you stay there and I'll stay here and so after a while we were talking and we were drinking and we were smoking out and she would put her hand my hand on her stomach and I could feel her baby just contorting from the drugs and my instinct as a mother was not strong enough to go dial 911. I just sat there with her and just, you know, let's just, let's just party and roast your baby. You know, let's just frickin', you know, blow the world to pieces. And I know so many people have a hard time talking about that, but this is the human alcoholic condition. This is what it looks like. I don't want to get into shame. I don't want to hide my story. I don't want to hide how many Tricks I've turned, probably enough to fill up Dodger Stadium, whatever. Call Bill, call Lois, call Central Office, call somebody. I don't know. It's call anybody. You know, it's just the way it went. But eventually, I was in and out of jail so much, and I got sent to rehab after rehab, and somebody gave me these tapes by this guy named Bob Anderson, and he started this. Um, my home group is called Primetime. We have a website, primetimeisnow.com. Everything's for fun and for free. I'm not trying to sell anything. I'm not even one of those people that talks about my sponsors, sponsors, grand sponsors, sponsors, sponsor, <laughs> touch the hem of Bill Wilson's garment or whatever, <laughs> or mowed Clancy's lawn and pulled up the flag. I don't know. I'm just, you know what? There's one that has all power. And that one is God. May you find God now. And now will always mean now. So I start listening to these tapes by this guy named Bob Anderson. And he says that I'm going to be the same woman drunk as I am sober unless I have a psychic change. And, it, and he says the main part of the illness actually centers in the alcoholic's mind rather than her body. So I have to really pay attention to my thought life because... My thoughts are infected with untreated alcoholism all day long, especially first thing in the morning when I wake up. It just wakes me up in fear. I have no capacity to regulate my emotional state. And what I'm going to do, instead of using psych meds or men or stealing or alcohol or whatever, I'm going to start using prayer and meditation to regulate my emotional state so that I can just make a phone call, so I can just drive my car, so I can just talk to someone, because I'm a hot mess. I really, I cannot handle a lot. I still can't. I don't juggle a whole lot of stuff. Mm -mm. Most alcoholics are not good 
at multitasking. So stop all that multitasking, okay? <laughs> Do whatever you want. I'm just not good at it. I'm just not good. I'm not very good at it. It's, it's not a good thing for me. I'm giving a little bit here and a little bit there, and then I'm, I'm not focused. And the God consciousness teaches me to get focused. So I start to see that the first half of step one says I'm powerless over alcohol. Duh. You wouldn't be here in Tennessee on a Friday night. I wouldn't have flown in all day long all the way from California to hang out with you guys. I'd rather be with a husband I don't have and a bunch of kids and grandchildren in my beautiful home with my chopping block in the middle of my marble kitchen hanging out making pizzas in my stone oven. But I'm not. I'm here. I don't have a stone oven or a pizza cutter or any of those things. I don't. I have an apartment. So anyway... I start listening to this message, and the second half of step one is a dash that my life is unmanageable. And he'd say, don't get stuck in the dash. 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 It's my thought life that's unmanageable. You see, this information isn't a race. It's a process. And most of us have a couple of brain cells bumbling around up there trying to make a couple of babies. You know, we're not, the, we're not the sharpest knives in the, in the toolbox. It's okay, you know. I'm one too. I'm not the brightest bulb. I don't even want to pretend to be. I don't know. There's a lot I don't know. There's a lot I can't remember. People say, I told you last week. And I'll think, okay, great. Tell me again. I don't remember you know what do I look like Einstein I smoked a bunch of crack and drank vodka for half my life right you know crying out loud you know so I start listening to these tapes and I listen to them like my life depended on it and it says that I have to seek through prayer and meditation to improve my conscious contact with God And that's the only way I'm going to come to believe that a power is going to restore me. So I start just begging this God, can you just protect me from my mind? Because my mind is trying to mug me all day long. I'm a piece of crap. I'm a piece of shit mother. I'm a whore. I'm a this. I'm a that. I'm every name in the book. I'm so bad. Nobody likes me. I remember at one point, And there was this wide open space for God to come in because I remember I wasn't a daughter. I wasn't a worker among workers. I wasn't a mother anymore. I wasn't anything. I was in my fourth rehab again. I mean, I I didn't have a car. I didn't even have a driver's license. I didn't have a cell phone. Like, I am talking bottom off the street. Crazy, crazy, crazy. Getting in arguments and fights everywhere I go. I was sure there were microchips in my eyes. They're following me. I'm paranoid. You know, like, really, like, the government and the CIA spends that much money following us? Like, what do they got on me? Like, how am I so important, you know? Can you imagine how much money it would be to even just have, like, three people follow you all day long? It's got to be at least, like, a couple hundred bucks an hour. Like, I don't get it. I don't, where does it even come from? But it doesn't necessarily go away. I mean, really, you know, glass in hand, I warp my mind into such an obsession for destructive drinking or thinking that only an act of providence can remove it and and to just have wet brain and to just pour so much alcohol in your system it's going to take it's going to take a while i think it's on on 133 in in the big book i think it says a body badly burned i don't want to paraphrase but i might paraphrase maybe i'll just paraphrase (laughs) a body a body a body a body Wow. Body badly burned by alcohol does not recover overnight, nor does, nor does uh, twisted thinkling vanish in a twinkling. Yeah, or depression vanish in a twinkling. We are convinced that the spiritual mode of living is the most powerful health restorative. I mean, we're, we're, we're so crazy. We, there's so much wrong with us. You know, it, it also says in, in the book, 94 and 95 are always good ones for me. It says, outline the program of action explaining how I made self-appraisal, how I straightened out my past, and why I am here endeavoring to be helpful. It is important 
for the alcoholic to realize that my attempt to pass this on to him plays a vital part in my own recovery. Actually, he may be helping me more than I'm helping him. And then I love this one because I feel like this one isn't always practiced enough. Never, never, never talk down to an alcoholic from any moral or spiritual hilltop. Simply lay out the kit of spiritual tools for his inspection. Show him how they work for you. Offer him friendship and fellowship. Tell him that if he wants to get well, you'll do anything to help him. I love this part. If he's not interested in your solution and he expects you to act only as a banker, financial, or one the heck out. <laughs> and my sponsor used to make me memorize that. I had to memorize this over and over. I'm not a bank. I'm not a hotel. I'm not a taxi. And I'm not a restaurant. I'm not a bank. I'm not a hotel. I'm not a taxi. I'm not a restaurant. I'm not a bank. I'm not a hotel. I'm not a taxi. I'm not a restaurant. And I still make pe- I still people do the craziest thing. Years of sobriety. And they like... Take out fifteen thousand dollars on a credit card and loan it to someone they barely know, and the person's going to promise to pay them back. And I'm like, God, just suck on a loaded gun next time. Like, what, what, what are you thinking? You know, what are you thinking? And I guess you know they needed that that lesson, whatever it was. So as time goes on, the seeking through prayer and meditation to improve my conscious contact with God begins to regulate my nervous system and um, my sponsor would say I have no business looking in the past or the future there's only one moment and it's the present moment and it's the most valuable moment I have still to this day the only moment I can download the fourth dimension the only moment that I can have a relationship with God is only in this moment there isn't any other moment so when am I going to do this when are you going to do this when are we going to do this when I get home, maybe next week, when I go to church, when I decide to be nice again. You know, it's it's not even a daily reprieve. It's just a moment-by-moment-by-moment by moment by moment reprieve contingent on the maintenance of my spiritual condition. And every day is the day I must carry the vision of God's will for me into all my activities. And what are my activities? My activity is, is this. And like Charlie was talking about, he so eloquently talked about self and you know it says you know to turn my will and my life over to the care of god you know i offer god i offer myself to the selfishness and self-centeredness we think is the root of our trouble driven by a hundred forms of fear self-delusion self-seeking stuff that those of our fellows they retaliate sometimes seemingly without provocation you know God, I offer myself to thee. You know, we must be rid of the self or it kills us. Constantly reminding myself I'm no longer running the show. It's there. It's all over the place. And yet, I don't know, people just think that AA is the place to go and just, like, get up on the podium and talk about their dead canary or I don't know what. what. You know, I really feel like this is sacred ground. And my, my grand sponsor used to say, If you don't have a message, maybe you better sit down. He used to say, this ain't a moaning and groaning meeting. And, you know, even if I had a bad day, which I didn't, even if I was having a bad week, which I haven't, I would not come up here and tell you, my, my life is falling apart. I just, I, I just couldn't do it. I, I couldn't do that to a room full of people. Where's the experience, strength, and hope? I'm coming up on 19 years, and I've had 19 years of really good stuff, really amazing stuff. And maybe there was a car accident, or I don't know, a, a cancer diagnosis, or whatever. You know, this program doesn't promise us bad things won't happen. It promises us that I can meet the calamity with serenity as long as I'm spiritually fit. And that means the conscious mind and the subconscious mind have to connect. You know, like Emmett Fox talks about, let me see if I can just find it real quick. There's so many things in here. You're going to hate me for wasting so much time. It's the, it's the, it's the golden key. You must, if you have a problem, no matter what it is, stop that obsessing. You must stop thinking of the trouble, whatever it is. The rule is to think about God. If you're thinking about your difficulties, you're not thinking about God. 
To be continuously glancing over your shoulder in order to see how matters are progressing is fatal because it is thinking of the trouble and you must think of God and nothing else. Your object is to drive the thought of the difficulty out of your consciousness. And that like, takes a ton of spiritual push-ups. Like, that's no joke. That's not like, oh, just do it once and poof, it's gone. It's like all day long, especially with a hatred story or somebody ripped you off, somebody cheated you. You know, you mess with my warped instincts, and I'll show you a warped instinct. I'll show you a turbocharged warped instinct. You will not like it at all. I will make your life so miserable. I will talk so much smack. I will get this close to you like some baseball coach in a game like that. And I don't want that. I don't like that. I can't stand that feeling. It's so toxic. It's so sickening. I'd rather, I'd rather let go and let God. That doesn't mean that once in a while we stand up for something or we'll lay down for everything. You know, once in a while I stand up for something. But I really think, logically, power, what would you help me do? And you know what? Because we're in the nut house, every once in a while, I do believe you really do have to scream at an alcoholic. You really do. Sometimes you just do. It's just the way it is. We're in the nut house. They don't take it all politely. Excuse me, can I talk to you for a few minutes after the meeting? You're acting very inappropriately, and I'd like to ask you to stop. Oh, hell no. It's like, you know what, bro? Let me tell you something. I see you do that here again, and mm -mm -mm -mm. you can go somewhere else, because we don't need you. You need us. And it's just the way it has to go, but people have so many opinions about that, or they don't know how to express themselves or they they say things to me like how do you think that that's God's will that sure is a big ego you know God can make strong what is weak and God can lower and soften what is too big I don't just run around on my muscles screaming all over town at everybody but I'll tell you you know, sometimes you get a real wing nut in a egg. Give me a, give me a, give me a pervert or a 13 stepper and I'm all over it. I'm just all over it. I am that one woman. I am that one woman that will let you know there will be police and a restraining order. You get yourself and your dick out of this room. And there are 4,000 other AA meetings in Los Angeles, and you know what? This ain't the one for you. And it's the only room that I have any control over is my home group. And, you know, sometimes people don't like it. Too bad, then don't come to my meeting. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what else to say. I, I want to protect the women. I want people to be able to come back. I want people to feel safe. You know, and, and God says, or the, 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 the steps say that we, that, that we take our, our liabilities and we turn them into our greatest assets. And so I was wild and I was alpha and I was all over the place. And now God takes my alpha femaleness and it turns it into something good. I can take a stand for something healthy, for something spiritual, for something safe, for something safe for women, children, men, for the group. And, you know, the common welfare of the group comes first. It just does. Like we say it all the time in our, in our traditions, but who's really thinking it? Oh God, not that clown again. You know, that guy that shares for 45 minutes every time the thing ding dings dings and dings and dings and dings you know I mean I just go up to him and I go do you, do you hear the timer like you think this is your world like what's a trip buddy you, you gotta share every single time the same blah 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 I, I don't care there's no rule that says I shouldn't do it so I do it so I say it call Lois <laughs> oh yeah Anyway, I'm, I'm really, I'm not trying to piss anybody off. I love God. I blew up my life. God has straightened my life out. I live by spiritual principles. I'm not a liar. I'm not a cheat. I'm not a thief. I got a 33-year-old daughter. She's getting married April 8th. I cannot believe, like a wedding. And she never had a dad, ever. 
And I'm walking her down the aisle. Now, I never thought that she would ask that of me. I was sure it would be like her fiancé's father. It never occurred to me. It didn't even hurt my feelings. I just never thought, not this crazy alcoholic crack whore. And she went and she, like, picked out my dress. And she wants me to write a speech. And I'm just like, are you kidding? Like, what is this life? What is this life? And this is the life that they talk about beyond your wildest dreams because... There are so many women in here that really messed up with their children. There are so many moms in here, and there are so many children that have just had so much fracture and so much pain, and I am not here to judge any of you because, believe me, I did it just like everybody else. I was in and out of jail, and someone else was raising my daughter. She was having panic attacks. They wanted to put her on medication, and she's like, I'm not going on medication. My mom's a hippie. I'll take herbs, you know. (laughs) Oh, God, bless her heart. You know, and I have a good business. I have a private practice. I make a great living. I, like, stepped in gold in a very, very, very peculiar way, like the way that God makes you step in gold. Like, you're not looking for it. And within six months, you know you're going to be very, very wealthy very, very soon. And it's like that kind of stuff. Self isn't even capable of that. Self would have, I don't know what, self would have gone for the hedge fund. I don't even know what a hedge fund guy is. Self would have gone for the hedge fund, you know. I didn't go for the hedge fund. I stayed with God, and and I stayed in spiritual principles, and I stayed in working with others, and I stayed in prayer, and I stayed in meditation, and I stayed in belief, and I and I kept in my lane, and and I tried to stay just humble. Just a really good, quiet, humble servant. That doesn't mean my ego doesn't ever go away. My ego is never my ego, especially in something that's hot. You know, the ego jumps. It, it, it's there to protect. It's going to get something. It's going to bite. It's going to do something. But I back down, you know. Thank God I have a brake pedal, and I'm like, no, 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 no. We're not going to do that today. And God inside of me absolutely makes that possible. You know, I think I'm going to wrap it up. It's 9.30, and I'm so grateful to be here tonight. It's really an honor and a privilege. And thank you, Ben, and thank you, everybody else. And right on for AA. We're the winners. Thanks. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.